Hey, people. Any questions before we start? Okay, we're gonna do some steroids today. Um, yeah. Before we do some steroids, uh, <laughs> could we go into a little more in depth with uh, the creatine aspect? Um, because I noticed a lot of pre-workouts have creatine in it. So what factor does it do to like help a person amp up? Like, or... It doesn't do any amping, it's just performance. If you wanna amp, I mean, just do caffeine. All of these like nitric oxide things, I wouldn't do that. I, I, most of it is sort of placebo and, and let's throw a bunch of niacin in there, whatever, like tingle, whatever it is that they're, that they're throwing in there. But uh, the caffeine is really the active thing that does stuff that, that's going to, you know, amp you up. But endocrinology, you guys are good with this stuff. Cell ceiling cascades, that's really what we're going to move into as soon as, okay, so the question BCAAs, branch chain amino acids. Yeah, leucine is great, but the, the BCAAs are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And um, the, uh, isoleucine, I, I, I don't know, just take the leucine. If you can get um, isolated leucine, now it doesn't mix. You get like a, a, just pure powder leucine and just, and you mix it in the glass for 10 minutes and you drink it. And then if you breathe in a little bit, you cough because it's just like powder just, just goes into your mouth and lungs and nose and, and holes. And the BCAA, so just, just get uh, leucine and lysine, which is not a BCAA, and arginine. If you get those three, those are the those are the amino acids that work really well. It's just people sell BCAAs because they sound cool, and I think they don't know the the physiology of that stuff. But one of those three is really is really useful. One of those three BCAAs, um, binding proteins, regulation of lipolysis, phosphodiesterase. Make sure you know these things. Uh, the phosphodiesterase PDE, technically PDE three B, if we're in a fat cell but P phosphodiesterase, that's all you need to call it, PDE, your phosphodiesterase, um, what that's doing. I mean, just, there's, it, this is the uh, point of, of interaction for drugs and supplements and, and uh, you know, hormones. I mean, PDE and PKA and PKB and these little hubs are going to affect how our, our basic metabolism, right? So not basal, but our basic metabolism of, of are we in anabolism? Are we in catabolism? Uh, what, what is our protein turnover? Are we growing? Are we shrinking? Hypertrophy, atrophy, these balances of all of this. Uh, this is, this is, you know, PKA, PKB, uh, AMPK, PDE. I mean, a lot of these, yeah, it's a bunch of of letters and it's it's increasing your vocabulary in an obnoxious way nobody wants to memorize all of the shop talk all of the uh, you know new vocabulary for something and and like hsl pka and and atgl i mean just look at this one slide and there are all these abbreviations but it's really helpful to get that language down to get to memorize stuff because if you want to speak a language fluently you begin by memorizing vocabulary and then you get to start using it and, and it becomes much more interesting speaking i'm horrible at foreign languages but let, let's say it's like french speaking french would be more enjoyable once you have a vocabulary like if i'm trying to think of a word and i don't know any words for anything and and that gets a little bit obnoxious and so you want to, I mean, just like if somebody says, you know, I'm fluent in whatever, I'm fluent in Spanish. What do you mean by fluent? Do you know how to say, you know, viscous fluid uh, was, was slinking down the steps? Do you know how to say that? Well, no, I can say wet downstairs or whatever. Like you're not, you know, fluent then. And so to be fluent in physiology, is to know a lot of the vocabulary. You can't be fluent in, in physiology. And I, I wouldn't say I am fluent in physiology because physiology is pulmonary, right? It's reproductive, it's, it's cardiovascular, it's integumentary, which is the most boring thing in the world to me is skin. And you know, there, there's so many disciplines within physiology that I'm not fluent in physiology. Yeah, I'm fluent in all that stuff on a 129 level. I used to teach 129 like twice a semester. And so I'll, we'll do renal physiology. We'll do how the liver works, but it's all basic stuff. You know, it's, I don't have a PhD in that stuff. And 
muscle physiology, I'm fluent. But that's it. That's the only domain of physiology I would consider myself fluent, where I can say, you know, the viscous solution trickles down the manhole cover in physiological terms. Because again, if you can't say that in Spanish, you're not fluent in Spanish. I, I don't care what, what, you know, supportive person told you. You're fluent in this. It's not true if you don't know the vocabulary at that level. You can be you know, have passable expertise, or you, you can, you can understand it and like get by and, and not encounter problems, but fluency is different. And nobody's actually, I don't even know that anyone's fluent in any language. I don't think I'm fluent in English. There's tons of, I open up the dictionary and there's tons of words I don't know. But we, we get to some point of what you could enter the realm of being fluent once you know enough vocabulary. And there's a lot of vocabulary here, hormone sensitive lipase and protein kinase A and perilipin and what a cytosol is and phosphodiesterase and um, adipose triglyceride lipase. I mean, this is all on one slide. And so getting to know this vocabulary, if you can do that first, you learn the vocabulary first, then it makes sense what I'm saying. Now, if, if you're encountering words that you don't know, the sentences aren't going to make sense. And so what you want to do, if I introduce a new word, you want to know that word for the next lecture. Uh, don't allow vocabulary to build up without expanding your understanding of of physiological parlance, let's call it. So adipose triglyceride lipase, this is just, this is the thing that insulin is going to interact with, with one of the long-term effects of insulin on adiposity, on, on body composition alterations, increasing fat storage, adiposity, it's all, it all means the same thing. So uh, adipose triglyceride lipase, again, make sure you get these words down so that when I say them, you're not just lost and like, whatever, I'll just start online shopping. Make, make sure you get the vocabulary down. And so this is the first one that when we're going to do lipolysis, lipid lysis, we're going to lyse our triglycerides, we're going to chop them up. The first one is adipose triglyceride lipase. And that seems to be regulated by insulin in a long-term sense, in a genetic sense, uh, more slowly, but the gene expression, right, the expression of it. But hormone-sensitive lipase, the second one that's going to take the um, diacylglycerol, the, like a diglyceride, you know, triacylglyceride or glycerol, um, diacylglycerol, uh, monoacylglycerol, right? So you think of triglycerides, the glycerol and the three fatty acids on it. Um, so triglyceride. And so the tri is chopped up by adipose triglyceride lipase. And that's insulin regulates that on more of a long term uh, through gene expression. Uh, the insulin regulates the next step, hormone sensitive lipase, very immediately and acutely. And it doesn't really seem to do anything with, at the gene level for that one. But that's through phosphodiesterase, right? Because PKA is much activates much more potently um, HSL hormone sensitive lipase than ATGL adipose triglyceride lipase insulin activates hormone sensitive lipase way more potently than it does adipose triglyceride lipase it just doesn't seem to do anything at the gene level uh, and so if PKA is deactivated. If, if you activate phosphodiesterase with insulin and phosphodiesterase converts uh, cyclic AMP into AMP, AMP doesn't bind to PKA, PKA is not activated, then PKA isn't phosphorylating anything, so you're not really burning fat. So in the short term, um, this is insulin down here, in the short term, insulin is inhibiting hormone-sensitive lipase and pyrilipin, right, the, that coat, the, the protective coat around that lipid droplet. And in the long term, uh, there seems to be adipose triglyceride lipase, on through expression, reduction of expression. So you know second messenger, cyclic AMP is the first one ever identified, but there's a lot of second messenger molecules, cell signaling cascades. Oh, uh, PKA, PKB, right, catabolic, anabolic, and the signaling cascades, right? So this is just, you know, we know um, insulin receptor substrate and, and uh, PI3K and PKB, AKT, PKB, same thing. And we're going to talk about mTOR. Uh, we're going to talk about P70S6K. 
um, sometimes like S6K1. This one has a ton of names. And you know a little about GLUT4. But so these signaling cascades, you should begin to know these things. They should be familiar to you. If they're not familiar to, to you, make sure you rewatch these until they are. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm in a review section and you find yourself not knowing the words that I'm saying, you should probably rewatch bits of previous lectures and take notes on them to make sure that what I'm saying is a refresh, right? That in the review section, we are reviewing. Now, I might have some different slides now and again in the review section, but I'm talking about the same stuff through some different pictures or different slides, things like that. Adenylate or adenylyl cyclase, right? We're converting ATP into cyclic GAMP. Cyclic GAMP binds to PKA. That's activating PKA, protein kinase A. It's a kinase. It phosphorylates stuff. Hormone sensitive light base is one of the things that it phosphorylates. Technically, it does this one. This is adipose triglyceride lipase, uh, which is the PKA is really a potent stimulator of hormone sensitive lipase and perilipin. Um, so the perilipin to phosphorylate that, and then we're opening it up. And just, you know, the anabolic and catabolic stuff, there's more to it. And we're going to get into some of these details because a lot of this, these are the, the ingredients that you can manipulate. You can cook up a dish in the kitchen of hypertrophy. You can cook up a dish in the kitchen of, of atrophy or of, you know, lipolysis. But you have to know how to combine ingredients, right? So if you, what I, what I mean cook up in the kitchen is to your own body, right? If you know all of the ingredients for lipolysis, you can maximize fat loss in a workout. You can use this. All of this information I'm talking about is employable. It's, it's you know, prescriptive. You can take this stuff, use it, and stop wasting time on a jog or in the weight room or in the kitchen with what you're eating, something like that. You can combine these things and actually use them. And so getting into the anabolic or the catabolic and using these things appropriately. So just remember all steroid hormones, whether it's testosterone or cortisol or aldosterone, estradiol, whatever, all of these different steroid hormones, they're coming from cholesterol. They begin with cholesterol. Testosterone has this diurnal effect, um, circadian or diurnal. Uh, it has this 24-hour cycle uh, in younger you know, guys. And remember, you can manipulate it with, with your diet. And so when you see like, okay, I guess I haven't talked about this. So free testosterone versus total testosterone. There's like one and a half percent, maybe, maybe a couple percent, something like that, of, of testosterone is actually free. Most testosterone, we keep talking about these binding proteins, uh, whether it's folostatin or insulin-like growth factor binding proteins, one through six, you know, 98% is bound and 80% is bound to binding protein three. We keep talking about these binding proteins, SHGB down here at the very bottom, that's sex hormone binding globulin, sex hormone binding globulin. And this is a binding protein, right? So it's a binding protein for both, you know, testosterone and, and you know, like estradiol and, and about half of it is bound to that. Strongly, I'm not going to ask you about SHGB on the test. So this is just, I'm going to present more information than I hold you accountable for because it's useful information. And if you go on to graduate school, you'll be sort of expected to know these things, not for like physical therapy, if you go into physiology, you'll be expected to know these things. And um, so sex hormone binding globulin, this binds the, uh, the you know, male and female um, sex hormones strongly. And then about the other half of it is bound weakly to albumin. So about half of your sex hormones are bound to albumin weakly. And the other half is bound you know, strongly to your, to this guy. Um, but then, you know, dihydrotestosterone, andestendione, um, dihydroepiandrosterone. And so that's the, you know what all this stuff is. Um, but you just see if you are going on a high fiber diet and a low fat diet, you can lower your testosterone and 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 it was fast actually when you look at at shgb this it's something that appears a little bit more momentous here so if you go on the baseline to low fat to high fat you see um total testosterone testosterone go way down when you hit a low fat diet and it starts to recover on the high fat diet but it doesn't fully recover it'll eventually recover but look at um shbg 
So it goes from you know baseline to low fat diet, and then you go back to the high fat diet, and it just keeps going down. There's something very momentous about it. It's the same thing that you see over here, um, where you see you know, 40.5, and then it starts to go up with a high fat diet, and you switch to a low fat diet, and it keeps going up. It's just it's a little bit slower. I know I'm not going to ask about that at all on a test, um, but you just have to know you know testosterone really for for you know its behaviors uh, in response to to nutrition, and then estrogen. Remember that estrogen is anabolic. Estrogen is anabolic, but a, it's not anabolic in the exact same way that testosterone not as testosterone is not as potently, and it corresponds to elasticity. Just think what you know. Females are are biologically programmed to endure. You got to be a little bit flexible for that. There has to be some elasticity for that, and uh, and so it is. It does correspond to. I don't know when this was. Maybe oh five, oh three, so, something like that. Uh, people were getting really into you know menstrual cycle and knee injuries and soccer players and stuff like that. And it was a huge national subject that everyone was investigating at American College of Sports Medicine and, and sort of similar institutions were really focused on that. It's fascinating, but you know, I'm not going to ask about that, just as long as you know that estrogen, and we'll talk about the mechanisms, estrogen is anabolic, but in, in, a, in a unique way. You know myostatin and folostatin. And IGF-1, we've talked a lot about IGF-1, autocrine, paracrine, endocrine. The, the liver is your big endocrine uh, piece of it, uh, where most of it is coming from. And growth hormone. It, remember, growth hormone is it's pulsatile in its release. It's get some deep sleep. And you really wear a Fitbit and see how much deep sleep you get. And if that's an accurate representation of actual deep sleep, you're getting a nice, uh, healthy pulsatile dose of growth hormone in you. Also fasting, if you're fasting, growth hormone releasing, ghrelin, growth hormone releasing, GHR, growth hormone releasing, ghrelin. Uh, that's if you're, if you're fasting, you don't have... <clears throat> Uh, you know, calories on board for a while, you get ghrelin released from your stomach and, and some from the intestinal tract. And that is going to induce a growth hormone response. And the characteristics of exercise, intense exercise, growth hormone is going to respond to intense exercise. You, you will get more of it. Uh, that way. And so, you know, strenuous or vigorous exercise. It's the Jack stat, genus kinase. If you recognize Jack stat, that's, that's good enough. We're not really going to go through this signaling cascade, signal transducer, activator of transcription. So in, in genetics, if you've taken one of the bio courses that talked about genes or you took genetics, uh, transcription and translation, we're going to talk about translation. Uh, in, for this class, because that's mTOR. Let's let's get translation going. Let's let's ramp up protein synthesis. But you know, transcription. This is this is you know pre-translation, transcription, translation. So, um, so that's what the the signaling cascade gets a little bit uh, involved on on that side. It does have its own. It's not the only thing. Like some cytokines will do this too. But but just remember that growth hormone takes time. Growth hormone takes a bunch of time. Stuff that promotes it, stuff that inhibits it. Don't get super stressed in life. You, you, you can deplete some growth hormone with, with high levels of you know, glucocorticoids and cortisol. Um, now you need some. There's a, there is a very intricate balance between glucocorticoids and, and growth hormone, but overexpressions of this stuff, you can start to kill it a little bit. So I wouldn't get like a super stress response. Obesity itself seems to reduce it, both in terms of uh, less release and more clearance. So uh, obesity by itself is, is, is doing it. And, oh, sleep deprivation is going to kill it. Uh, sleep deprivation is going to kill your, your growth hormone. Um, Tons of IGF-1. If you have tons of IGF-1, you're going to, I mean, they say that you're going to be growing, but uh, that's a, that is um, going to uh, reduce your, your growth hormone um, just because what's downstream from growth hormone, right? Downstream from growth hormone, the liver is supposed to be releasing your IGF-1. 
Um, and so you will modulate your levels that way. And, and it's, that's one of our stuff that kills growth hormone. Stuff that turns on growth hormone, again, get nice sleep, vigorous exercise, fasting, arginine actually, um, and amino acid arginine. So there's lots of stuff that'll turn it on, lots of stuff that will that will turn it off. Um, we know all about the, the pituitary T3, T4, sort of a hybrid of a steroid and a polypeptide. It is a polypeptide. It's from tyrosine. It's the amino acid. This is a mean hormone, but but it crosses the membrane by transporters and gets inside. And so in that sense, it's, it's closer to um, a steroid in terms of its its receptor binding. Now remember, as you do cardiovascular exercise over time, you can increase cortisol and decrease testosterone. All right. So steroids, getting back into steroids. I told this story, you don't need to know the story. I mean, I told you don't take notes while I was while I was saying it. But I like to set the scene for what I'm talking about. Before I leap into a subject, I like to say, okay, okay, let's establish the scene. Let's let's do a little background. Let's all get on the same page. And then we'll start turning pages. And so I told the story of Anastasia, right, 19 teens, and the Romanov family, and, and there's these four daughters, and she's one of them, and she's killed by the Bolsheviks. They, like, gun her down, and it's, like, this gruesome, bloody massacre. And then you remember the, the, the unknown woman you know, emerges from this lake in, this, in Berlin, the river in Berlin, and... and he was put in this asylum and and then she just starts going like oh, i'm anna anderson and starts suing for her inheritance and you know where's my shit give me my stuff i'm i'm anastasia i should be super wealthy i'm a grand duchess give me my stuff and you know the story Ernest, right hires this private investigator anastasia's uncle hires a private investigator and he's like nah it's not her um that's francesca shanskowska that's who that is and this is, this is all ridiculous this is like insane polish woman and if you look at the pictures, right, there she is. There's Anna Anderson, right? Circa 27. And here's Francesca Shinskowska, right? Just, just look at the mouth. How, how could that be anyone else? The mouth and the crazy eyes. And I'm sure she was a wonderful, nice person. But uh, when, when the news came out, remember I was in middle school. They did the DNA evidence and they said, absolutely. Um, Anna Anderson is Francesca Shanskowska. No, she is not Anastasia. There is no chance. I mean, there is just no chance in the known universe or the unknown universes. No chance that this woman is Anastasia. You people are crazy. They didn't phrase it like that. I'm being insensitive. Uh, they were very sensitive uh, with it. I mean, this woman had just died 10 years before and she has all these fans. And, and that was 94, right? 97, the movie comes out. 97, the movie comes out and like, oh, she's Anastasia. D this is so crazy and th it is not an exception from how we behave in life right how we behave in life is is we we come up with these emotional positions and we defend sentimentality to the grave and when science is so blatantly in opposition to these emotional positions. And so as we move forward into, into our steroid discussion, I would just ask that we put emotions aside, that we put sentimentality or, or unscientific positions or, well, I grew up thinking, okay, you know, once upon a time, slavery was normal. Yeah, I mean, once upon a time, I mean, you can do all of these once upon a times and, and you know, nobody in the South liked Abe Lincoln. This is a terrible comparison right, of slavery and steroids. That's a horrible comparison to make, but you get the idea of once upon a time is not a good justification or, well, you know, this is traditionally traditions, unless they're harmless or um, this is not a good reason to adhere to something science is a reasonable reason to adhere to something so I would just ask that everybody is open-minded and you put assumptions and and um, you know whatever notions you have aside if they're inconsistent and incompatible with the state of evidence if evidence and emotion run contrary to each other i would hope that we, we could we could accept science and evidence and logic and reason and rationality and all of those non-tender domains so ergogenic aid 
Mechanical, psychological, physiological. Physiological is all I care about. We know what these things are. Who cares? Yeah, you have better equipment and stuff. Physiological aids, Tylenol, caffeine. You know how caffeine works. We're going to talk more and more about how steroids work. We'll get to creatine. We'll get there. But physiological aids, just remember some of these things totally unrelated or unregulated, rather, to totally un regulated. Some of them are conditionally re uh, regulated, right? If Adderalls and inhalers, stuff like this, which are definitely ergogenic aids. Definitely huge performance enhancers, but you have to have a doctor's prescription. You have to have evidence of some specific thing. Schedule three controlled substances. These are totally illegal. And you can like go to jail for these. You have them and you're going just going to jail. Like, well, you know, I just saw this in your kitchen and you're, and you're going to jail. So think about the history of drugs. Now there's compelling evidence. I'm not saying this is the extent of the story, but there is compelling evidence that the reason particular drugs are illegal or have a history of illegality is racism, right? So who did cocaine and, and crack and stuff. I mean, traditionally, what we're looking at is African-American populations. Who did peyote, right? That's Native American populations. Who did cannabis, right? That's Mexican populations. What about opium? Well, this is Asian populations. And who smoked cigarettes? A bunch of white guys. So which one of those is legal? You know, and, and so there's more to the story, but the narrative is compelling. And even alcohol, you look at prohibition, what is alcohol? Well, those damn Irish, right? That's what we're, that, the, there's, there's a compelling narrative that can be told for racism as the illegality of drugs. Now, when you start comparing things like ibuprofen and Tylenol and, and a lot of prescription medications and, and or alcohol even to uh, steroids or cannabis or whatever, you start seeing that a lot of these illegal ones, so you just go to prison for, well, cannabis is illegal now, but with they have a history of you going to prison for, uh, the side effects are worse than the legal stuff. It has nothing to do with side effects. Well, does it have to do with like addictive properties? No, no, it doesn't have to do with that either. <laughs> so well, when we're throwing people in prison for what turn out to be something remarkably similar to racial, not just profiling, but, but racial incarcerations, uh, we have problems. We have ethical problems. And keep an open mind about steroids and, and their side effects and, and their and their actual effects of, of what people what they actually do and what people think they're doing um, because we can't just we can't legislate unscientific morality if if our legislations run contrary to science we're backwards I mean maybe we're not lost as a species but we're doing shit wrong so remember steroids these are just, these are cholesterol hormones. There's a picture of liver here. There's a picture of a liver because that's really where your cholesterol is coming from, the big regulator of cholesterol. And do know that because it's gonna come back with the steroid uh, oral versus injectable uh, hormones is the liver and some small intestine. Sure, there's other areas where you're getting your cholesterol from. Testes, ovaries, adrenals. Sure, yeah, we're, we're getting a little elsewhere. But meat cells, you know, you, you are meat. We're animals. We're animals that are locomotive. We move. We have legs and arms and we have meat. Um, in avocado, that doesn't have cholesterol in it. In avocado, doesn't it? Where's the liver and the small intestine? And I mean, uh, gonads, whatever, ahu a cattle. Um, but, but where are these, you know, glands and, and organs in an avocado? Well, it doesn't have it. Right? There's no, there's no cholesterol in an avocado. Now plants, plants have phytosterols. Not going to ask on the test, but plants have phytosterols, and these are similar to cholesterol. They're similar-ish. Um, they compete. They, they, they compete for absorption. Phytosterols. These are similar, but they don't have cholesterol. You get cholesterol from the meat, from animal things. If you get some animal derived thing, and this is just it's living in your in your 
uh, phospholipid bilayer. And again, the liver is, is the big regulator of all of this. The big producer and regulator is, is in the liver. But all of your steroid hormones, these things are coming from cholesterol. And androgens or, or anabolic androgenic steroids. Now we're getting into the stuff that people are talking about with steroids. We say like, oh, you know, he took steroids. Okay, did you get like a cortisone injection? That's taking steroids. You're injecting a steroid hormone into you, into some joint or something. Now it's horrible. It's a catabolic, terrible steroid, but terrible for, you know, uh, protein anabolism. But, but, you know, maybe it's good for, for relieving pain. It is good for relieving pain, but with lots of other side effects. But that's steroids, right? Oh, he's on aldosterone. That's not what people mean when they say they're taking steroids. You know, when people are, are attacking Barry Bonds, right? That, that is, uh, this is androgens. They're talking about androgenic steroids, anabolic androgenic steroids. And there are exogenous steroids. There are endogenous steroids. Remember endogenous uh, within exogenous without that you're injecting or swallowing this stuff and you can inject the same stuff you can swallow stenozolol super famous one um, that was the ben johnson drug i mentioned that this is 1988 in in korea and in, in south korea in, in the in the olympics and that's when the stenozolol test came out and he tested positive and Paul Thompson, I'm going to show you some of his research today. Paul Thompson it did a, oh, he was researching stenozolol at the time. So he became super famous on the subject of steroids. He's a brilliant, one of the smartest people I've ever met is Paul Thompson. And, and he did a bunch of work on steroids. And he's a cardiologist, right? He's, he's at Hartford Hospital and, and uh, he did his, his uh, you know, uh, work at Tufts his residency, I think, at, at Stanford. I mean, brilliant guy. But he was researching Winstrol at the time when this came out, so he became a big name. When you see stuff like esters, testosterone, esters, that's just, there's a carbon chain attached to it. And the longer the chain, the longer the half-life. That's all that means. But you don't need to know the names of any of these, right? You don't need to know Paul Thompson's name. Just stick with me on what this stuff is. Now, the question, is it ethical? to use steroids in sports. I have Joe Biden here saying, the fact is, because that's what he says, like every fourth sentence he begins with, the fact is, just watch the debates, the fact is, the fact is steroids aren't natural. They make sports unfair and they cause health problems. And I think Joe Biden's a lovely guy, but but he's part of the problem with, with the steroids. And that's the reason, that this is not an exact quotation. This is me putting words in his mouth, but these are words he would say himself because he is one of the legislative people to ban all of these things. He's, he's really the probably the biggest name in, in the banning of, of steroids. And maybe he wasn't the most involved, but he's certainly the biggest name of the involved people. Now, the athlete's health, right? This is an argument against, against uh, steroids. We talked about that one. Unnecessary risk for harm and undue social coercion. We talked about that one. This is like other people are doing it, so now I have to do it too. Steroids are unfair, the unlevel playing field. We'll get to that one. We talked about, we introduced it, but we'll do the actual full version of these. We just gave a brief introduction of all of them last time. And steroids contravene the spirit of the sport or they strip the soul from the sport. They they tarnish the sport, however you want to express that one. That sports have some sort of uh, oh, integrity, a soul, uh, something that, that can be um, soiled and spoiled. Natural versus unnatural. Steroids are unnatural. Uh, rules. We all signed up for something and you're breaking the rules. You, my friend, are are a rule breaker and that is not okay. Harm to other people, right? So harm to other people. If you're on steroids, then then other people who are not on steroids are taking harder punches and you, you can't return those punches as hard or, or, or your bear hug is gonna squeeze the life right out of them, whatever it is, harm to other people. And then the last one is they don't work anyway. Now there is a ninth that nobody ever thinks of it. Um, there is a ninth one and that's actually what everyone believes, but, but people People aren't, aren't thoughtful enough to, to state what they believe. They state what other people have declared. And what other people have declared are those eight. 
those are the eight things that, that people declare. The ninth one is actually what people feel because people make decisions emotionally most of the time. I do too, you do. We're very emotional people. And what we have to do is evaluate our decisions and say, am I being emotional here? Yes or no? If I'm just being emotional, is there something I could do better? The only thing we can change is ourselves, right? You can't change anybody else. So, so make sure that we're that we're being as scientific and sound in our thinking as possible. And those eight are what people say, but the ninth one is the actual emotional one, and we'll eventually get there. Okay, so we're gonna go through all of them, right? And we're gonna get through a few of them today. We'll get through maybe eight, one, and two. I put them in a different order. Now. Uh, they don't do anything. We're going to start with that one because it's the silliest. This is the most ridiculous one is they don't do anything. This is an article that, you know, androgen abuse by athletes. Um, it came out in 1988. And the first time that I documented, I took a screenshot um, on November 3rd, 2017, about almost exactly three years ago. And you can see it's right here. This is this is the article said 514 citations. That's a lot of citations. That is a big well-cited, powerful uh, article. People know this article, it's big. Now, were those citations all from like 91 and 92 and 93? No, because today I took another screenshot and it's up, what is that, like 61 citations. It's up 61 citations, we're at 575. This is today, this is over three years. I took both of these screenshots and, 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 and it's the exact, it's up 61 citations in the last five years, crazy numbers. People are still citing this. Now that doesn't say they're citing it in support. Maybe some people are, maybe some people are saying, you know, from the historical perspective, massive article, okay, this one. And it just says like this particular form of drug abuse, androgen abuse, right? Talking about steroids. Um, this particular form of drug abuse stems from the convergence of several separate misconceptions. It was assumed that the administration of androgens in super physiological amounts to normal men would do even more than the normal amount, right? Several misconceptions using steroids above the normal amount that you have um, is going to be advantageous. These are all quotations from the article. In men with normal levels of plasma androgens, the androgen receptor in most tissues appears either saturated or downregulated. Right, so if you introduce even more androgens, what are they going to bind to? The receptors are saturated. You can't even bind this stuff. Thus, you know, it's not possible to separate these actions, blah, blah, blah. The effects of androgens are purely psychological. Again, quotations. The effects of androgens, steroids, anabolic steroids, are, are purely psychological. Athletes believed that the androgens do enhance strength, and so they do, right? There's a, there's a lack of clear evidence that they do, in fact, improve athletic ability. It was 1988. After more than 30 years, it is still not clear whether androgens do, in fact, enhance athletic ability performance. Okay, we know this is this is sort of silly, but you know, nine studies failed to demonstrate an increase in muscle strength. And he shows all these studies, you know, in summary, blah, 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 a positive relationship between androgen use and athletic performance is unproven. And the effects on weight and muscle mass are inconsistent. So saying eh, androgens probably don't do anything anyway. That's that's what he's saying. Why would you do these? There's no evidence that they actually work. Why would you do that? Now, 88. Okay, this is like, you know, the last time the Dodgers won, I think. World Series, I was like Oral Hershiser days. And it was a little while ago, I was eight years old back then, depending on what month it came out. Um, but, you know, he also published something very similar in 1996. And here's another article that came out in 91. I did the exact same thing on in 2017, three years ago, I took a screenshot and had 162 citations. Today, I took a screenshot, has 173. So this one is only up 11 citations in the last three years, but it's saying similar stuff, right? Anabolic steroids may slightly enhance muscle strength in previously trained athletes. No firm conclusion is possible. Um, and again, this isn't where the buck stops. I mean, the buck just keeps on marching, keeps on inflating, whatever. The, the buck just keeps going. And the problem with some of this stuff is IRBs, institutional review boards, are not going to approve a study where you give somebody, you know, 1,000 milligrams of testosterone every, every week and say, all right, what happens to, to bench press? Not going to happen. Or 
or all right let's let's do like a you know the width of a last spread or the circumference of biceps or whatever it is on on huge on ronnie coleman doses of of testosterone nobody's gonna do that like oh yeah this is good for the you know the public health like that's not irbs aren't gonna improve that um it's just oh risk of side effects and and what good is this study doing and and so they do these tiny doses they use tiny sort of harmless doses and harmless doses are kind of useless at the same time so think about a therapeutic dose let's say you have a headache you have a headache and you take Tylenol, but instead of taking, you know, the full Tylenol, even like a whole pill, you take like a quarter of a pill, you break it up. You don't just do the half, right? You break it up, you do a little quarter, you do this little guy, you do this for Tylenol. What happens to your headache? Well, nothing, because it's not a therapeutic dose. Nothing changes in your headache. You need to reach a certain threshold to have this therapeutic dose. And this is something that's important to consider in life. You know, if like you just take like politics, you know, people won't invest enough. And so something fails. Like, oh, that policy failed because it was a bad one. No, it wasn't a therapeutic dose. You actually didn't invest enough in it. And then if you'd like studied the history of politics or understood the, the funding of these things, it would make more sense. Now, I'm, I didn't do political science. My brother did. That was what my brother majored in. But, uh, but this, this philosophy, this theory applies to pretty much everything, but applies so specifically to medicine and physiology. And if you take a little tiny dose, nothing happens, right? It's not a therapeutic dose. You don't hit that threshold. And so they can also work with HIV related wasting, cancer related, these muscle wastings, cachexia, cachectic patients. And if you work with a wasting syndrome, you're going you're gonna to see uh, improvement. Um, if you work with animal models, you know, bench science and animal models, you're going to see improvement. And we've been seeing this improvement for a long time. So 1973, 1984, 1988, 1989, animal models. We've been doing this for a long time, showing that steroids, anabolic, androgenic steroids, androgens have these major effects on animals. We just don't have randomized controlled trials in human beings. Um, yeah, what Jesse said in the, in the comment box, uh, uh, that's R RCT, randomized controlled trial, you couldn't do. There are ethical reasons you couldn't do this trial. We randomize people and say, all right, you get, a, you get 800 milligrams of tea, and over here, we're just going to inject you with, uh, you're getting saline or, or whatever. That's, you don't, you don't get that experiment. Um, and so in animal models, what you see, the myosatellite cells, you know, you see those little brown things? The blue guys over here are, those are nuclei, myonuclei, muscle cell nucleuses. The brown guys are little myosatellite cells. And um, they, they live between the, the sarcolemma and the, and the basement membrane. And, and what we're looking at is this donation of nuclei. Um, they donate a nucleus to the muscle. Now, having more nuclei is critical for growth. If you have more muscle nucleuses, growth can follow. You can't have a single government stretch that far. That's why the US has so many governments. California has its own, Stockton has its own, and you know the US has its federal one. You know, so you have this sort of you know, you have a central government, I guess, in the body, let's just say, you know, your central nervous system. But you know, let, let's get out into the periphery. And we need a lot of governments to control industry. In this case, translation of proteins. Let's make a bunch of proteins. But you can't stretch those proteins that far. You need a lot of nuclei. And you can increase muscle cell nucleuses, myonuclei with the use of steroids. Now again, wasting syndromes, you see a lot of this and um, how that stuff works. Um, whether it's you know HIV or you know again cancer or it could just be malnutrition. There's, there's a lot of things. Um, so you see all these different populations of, of wasting. You see animal models, bench science, how it actually works. You can find all these new myonuclei, and, and anytime you have more nuclei, you get to grow more, you get to translate more. And all of this stuff makes sense as far as steroids are, are super effective. Now there's there's a, there are conditional, there are conditional uh, situations in which people will say, well, 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 I'm Michael Phelps and I can't get heavy. You know, I have to be buoyant to a degree. I have, to, there's a physique that's optimal for swimming. And if I just go get meaty and Ronnie Coleman, it can probably barely tread water. 
you know, uh, not just because he's like, you know, it's like mangled legs and back and stuff now, but, but, you know, let's say like Jay Cutler or whatever. Yeah, he could barely tread water. He's so dense and it'll just sink. And, and I mean, he'll go straight to the bottom of the Mariana Trench if, if you leave him in the ocean. And, and okay, oh, fine. Okay. So there's some argument about, about, uh, weight to mass ratio or, or something like that rock climbing you know if you weigh 250 pounds it's harder to get up the wall um you know if you there's an argument about let's say it's weight classes for things or or a very linear sport where you're, you're talking about a the penation angle can change b this big rainbow of a bicep Right, that's not going to pull as effectively, right? If you're pulling in a straight line versus this rainbowing arc of of fiber alignments, and that's so, okay. Okay, maybe there are some structural, some architectural differences in a body, body composition, architecture of muscle that are less than optimal for specific contexts. Entirely possible, right? Entirely possible. The penation angle can change. I'm not going to ask questions about that, but just getting the idea that the penation angle can change, and and maybe there's there's a, a speed component, a quickness component to your sport that, that, is the, that is more important than overall mass heaving, you know, how much force you can generate. Yeah, what I'm not saying, I'm not saying steroids are optimal for every sport or something, you know, I'm saying they work, steroids work, and they enhance athleticism. But I'm not saying that, that every single context, every single person is going to be benefiting they're, they're going to be to be enhancing their capacity with the use of steroids now some people will say something like you know with power to weight ratio or something well you know i can barely you know ex explode off the ground anymore my vertical jumps are like ah, i don't know if i quite buy that because that's like saying well my car is so slow because the engine is so big it starts to sound stupid after a while. I mean, like go to the drag strip or something, and then he has these massive engines. Yeah, you know, I mean that's that's what steroids are are, are enhancing your engine. They're these machinists that are, if I if I quote my dad without understanding what he's saying, boring and stroking out a three fifty to a three eighty three. I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what that means. I'm I'm clearly not an expert in things of of you know machining. But, you know, the increase of myonuclei, the more myonuclei you get, if you can increase those, the number of myonuclei, you can expand the muscle a lot better. You now have a larger governable domain. You are not going to expand your territory beyond what you can govern. You know, we... We aren't conquerors, our, our physiology. We aren't conquerors. We only expand as much as we can control, as much as we can defend, as much as we can regulate, right? We don't just go, we're, we're, you're not like Julius Caesar, you know, going around and like, all right, give me the world. I mean, that, that, that's not how the body works, right? We, we are not biological conquerors now maybe psychological sure but our, our body we don't go expand our territories beyond what we can govern you have to get these governments in place first and then you can expand and steroids uh androgens do a good job of that uh, now this is just saying the same these are just articles if you're curious right if you're curious you, you can you can delve a little bit um you know, more completely into the literature of, of how this stuff works. That's the reason I put articles in here <clears throat> about all this stuff is if you feel compelled to read more, you know, you have a good starting place. I'm not going to ask about these specific articles. Just, you know, where to look, you know, where my information is coming from. You know what my education looks like on this and what I've read and, and where this information comes from. And if you want to do some of your own reading, you have the resources to do that. Um, so this is just me you know, trying to be as open as possible about the, the, the information and, and showing you that there are citations and that's where I'm learning all of these things and where like, in the past I have learned these things. Um, so androgen receptors, you have to bind to an androgen receptor. Um, like testosterone, this is the primary androgen interacting with skeletal muscle tissue. I'll say that again because that's important. The primary androgen interacting with skeletal muscle tissue is testosterone. Now, dihydrotestosterone can, can have a, a stronger um, uh, bind, but not in skeletal muscle, right? Let's, let's get into the prostate and let's make the prostate huge. Uh, so uh, testosterone, now you, you get into the, some of these older folks and you see older guys and, and both testosterone androgens and 
androgen receptors decline. Now, when both of these decline, one of them is easy to manage. Oh, just throw in some test, right? Throw in some T and let's get that back to where it belongs. But the problem is if you don't have the androgen receptors, if you don't have the androgen receptors for it to bind to, you're likely going to convert more than you want to dihydrotestosterone, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, and you have to dispose of that somewhere, right? So, so if you just go to the prostate and you get this huge prostate and you stay at the urinal for 10 minutes hoping pee comes out. So that is what the consequence of, of you know, a ton of, of DHT is, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia benign prostatic hyperplasia, um, dihydrotestosterone is a huge culprit in, its, in, in that effect. Um, that's not like, you know, you have prostate cancer and, and we're worried and stuff. That's just like your prostate got big and, and it's, it's like obstructing your urination behavior. Um, now, one of the best stories, <clears throat> don't write this down. This is another, this is another Romanov family narrative but we're a little bit more specific with steroids here. So one of my favorite stories about steroids is the East Germans. Now, East and Western, this isn't a thing anymore. It's 90, 1990, they, they homogenized, they, they absorbed each other. But the, the East German swimmers in 1972, they were okay. This is at the Olympics, right? They were okay. They won five medals, no golds, no records, but there were five medals of some sort, right? Metallic, you know, round things that, that they went home with. And four years go by, four years go by. And when they come back, they win 18 medals. The East German females only. This isn't like how many medals did the entire country win in all sports? This is the female swimmers. They won 18 medals, 11 of them gold set eight world records. So there were 12 individual events. They won gold in 10 of them. That's outrageous, right? Dolphins are not that good, right? Dolphins could not beat the East German female swimmers in 1976. And that's like in 1972, they were merely fine. And then they come back four years later. But what happened was they come back four years later and they're like dolphins with a Doberman bark. They're like, uh, you see them emerging from the pool and like these big, like masculine arms saying things like for the homeland or whatever and <clears throat> must disarm citizens or whatever it is that they come out of the pool saying and it's like Dwight Schrute speech is, is you know what it sounds like and except they're just this it makes my voice sound like a purse puppy compared to their Dobermans and clearly there's a lot of androgens on board and and this is this I just look at the comments this is a um, actual exact quotation. This is an exact quotation from one of the coaches and it's from the New York Times. Sorry, I'm not just like you know, pulling this out of nowhere. This is a New York Times article quoting one of the coaches that says, we came here to swim, not sing. When the athletes were accused of being, you know, masculine Dobermanly dolphins. And like, what is going on with these people? I mean, we, we have really really changed sexes here. I mean, this is, uh, and that was the, that was the, that was the response. So clearly the point of telling you this, this little story is A, for entertainment, because it's, it's fascinating. B, steroids work and androgens, man, these things work. And even in swimming, you wouldn't think swimming, you know, but it's what I said earlier, like, oh, Michael Phelps, I'm sinking and, and, and I'm just too big, I'm sinking. I'm, but like, apply this to any sport. If you can apply this to swimming and you go and you take over the world with your androgens, you're like, you're not that big of a country. You're half of a country. You're half of a not that big of a country. And you just take over the world with, with swimming. And that's with steroids. It applies to every sport, but conditionally. You know, I'm not saying rock climbing is like the optimal uh, environment for, for steroids. Now, I would say stuff, let's, let's call poker a sport. Fine, whatever. Uh, fine, poker is a sport. You can't get ragey when you're playing poker. You can't change your emotions when you play poker because you'll overbet your hand. You will, you, there, there are emotional, 
domains of sport that can be disrupted. So I'm not saying it's everything. I'm not saying saying every single sport, every context can be enhanced. Some sports and activities that are on the perimeter of sports can be ruined if you're if you're you know if you go on tilt as they say. But should they be banned in sports, right? That's the that's the debate. Should we be banning these things in sports because they're effective, right? So let's move on to the athlete's health. Let's move on to the next one. And I hope somebody will be my my timer because although I can look at the time, like I just never remember when this class ends. So the athlete's health. Um, Thomas Jefferson here, he was talking about religion. You know, it does me no harm to say, uh, for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or there is no God. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. That was, that was Thomas Jefferson. So like, we're, we're founding our, our great-ish nation with, with these premises. And uh, <clears throat> this is the same principle that should apply. You, we, we shouldn't have, you don't get to tell your neighbor what religion to believe in. That doesn't make any sense. And that's like, we, it's creepy. You don't get to tell your neighbor what type of exercise program they must do. Unless they hired you to be a personal trainer, right? Or they hired you for catechism or something. You don't get to tell your neighbor what they're eating unless they hired you to be their, your, their nutritionist. You don't, get to, you don't get to force decisions on your neighbor, right? So whether you do steroids, right? That, 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 doesn't affect your neighbor. Whether your your neighbor does steroids, that's not your health. Right? If you do steroids, your neighbor's liver is not affected. Your liver is affected. Crimes need victims. It's a victimless crime when we're talking about the athlete's own health. Who gives a damn about Barry Bonds's heart or Mark McGuire's liver or Jose Canseco's attitude? or whatever. I think he like blew off his thumb <laughs> um, recently. I don't know. Jose Canseco is a fascinating character. But who cares about, about other people's health? Right? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect you. You don't get to tell people what to do, right? That's, that's not how the, the, you know, certainly 21st century Western world, that's not how it works. You don't, you don't get to force your ethics on somebody else. Um, and if you think about it, if, if you were, you, you could say, all right, nobody gets to eat birth cake, birthday cake anymore. Uh, diabetes is out of control. Diabetes is out of control. And, and ooh, we just, enough with the birthday cake. Nobody gets to eat it. Peeps? No, nah. uh, no, those are illegal. We're, we're throwing you in jail for taking peeps. Uh, we would start to get into some really more than rocky terrain. We get into like magma terrain with with these enforcing of legislations of victimless crimes. Um, and so talk about the health of these things. You can do way more harm with peeps. You can really do, you can go blind, right? You get this, I mean, you can have these distal neuropathies and retinopathies. I mean, just, just overdo the peeps and you're gonna, you're gonna harm yourself to a degree that, you, that, is, that is, it will give you enormous regret or remorse, I guess, for your, for your decisions. But nobody's banning peeps, right? For 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 you know carb loading or whatever. Now Tylenol, you can kill yourself. You can kill yourself by taking Tylenol. Okay, you can kill yourself with vitamins. Go take a bite of a polar bear liver, and the vitamin A will kill you like that day. I mean, it's just like go nibble on a polar bear liver, and and good luck surviving that from vitamin A. And drink too much water, and you can die. Uh, any of these things will, will can can kill you in excess. Now, people will say, "There's a, whenever this this argument comes up, people say, well, it's so much easier to overdo steroids than Tylenol. Don't be ridiculous. Tylenol, uh, that's, you can just go down to the, I mean, you just take it for your headache and whatever, and, and nobody's abusing Tylenol. Where steroids, this is a drug of abuse. Tylenol isn't a drug of abuse. Tylenol is like, you get rid of your menstrual pains or your headache or whatever. Not true. If you look at the leading cause of liver failure in the United States, it is Tylenol. The number one cause of liver toxicity is acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. And we've known this for a long time, right? It's 2005, here, this is 2007 one, of uh, just looking at, at population-based surveillance for acute liver failure, you know, acetaminophen-associated overdoses. I mean, this really 
uh, this is the single leading cause of li 10 minutes thanks of liver failure in the in the US is Tylenol. So here's a 2008 article that um, the number one cause of acute liver failure in the United States, 50% of all cases, Tylenol, acetaminophen, right? 30% mortality. And after 2009, right, that's what this one is talking about, it doesn't necessarily improve. People started drawing a lot of attention to it, but, but it doesn't necessarily uh, improve after that. So conclusions, acetaminophen-related adverse events continue to be a public health burden. And so that one's 2016. And when you get into steroids, you get into steroids and you look at a lot of these publications sort of make stuff up and they don't really have any evidence for their claims, sort of false claims about, oh, here's the, the complications of steroids. And they get really emotional. Say, oh, it's terrible because your heart explodes. And they don't use the word explode, but, but we need to use science to support these things. Now, the liver does regulate uh, cholesterol, HDLs, LDLs, total cholesterol. And when you start looking at oral steroids versus intramuscular, that's the other um, technically intravenous, there's some a little bit, but, but intramuscular is, is this is a systemic one, just, you know, inject your glute and uh, oral steroids is just put it in your mouth and, and swallow it. You're going to affect your cholesterol if you swallow it. Now, if you swallow estrogen, you can improve your cholesterol. Your, your, your profile starts to look a little bit better with testosterone, with androgens, your cholesterol worsens. But so what's, what's the, the, what does that effect look like, right? Now, earlier I mentioned Paul Thompson, stenozolol, Paul Thompson, those should be uh, memorable uh, names. It was just, you know, half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago or something. And so oral administ administration of stenozolol, Winstrol or stenozolol, Winstrol is a trade name, reduced HDL by 33% after only one week of treatment. Testosterone, in contrast, injectable testosterone, comparably little change. So this is what it looks like. Um, so HDLs, if you do stenozolol oral, you eat it, you put it in your mouth and you eat it, you reduce HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol goes up. The bad stuff goes up, the good stuff goes down. And, but, but testosterone, HDLs don't go down, HDLs stay the same. And the LDLs actually go down. Like, so, so the people in this study, the people who were doing injectable testosterone improved their lipid profile. It was terrible if they were eating it because the first pass hepatic metabolism, the portal circulation, you eat it, anything comes out of your mouth, unless it's you know, absorbed you know, directly into the blood, um, anything you swallow and goes to your stomach and whatever, that's gonna go up to your liver first. The first pass hepatic metabolism. Your liver is the first stop for all that stuff, and your liver is 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 manipulating your your cholesterol levels. And so, if you eat it, yes, you ruin your cholesterol. If you inject it, nah, you're not you're not you're not ruining it. The other thing, you can get peliosis hepatis, not hepatitis, not hepatitis, peliosis hepatis, and this is blood filled cysts that will form on the liver if you're eating it. Blood-filled cysts can form on the liver. Is that common? No, it's super uncommon. It's so uncommon that it was a house episode. It was a house episode where it was like difficult to diagnose and whatever. It shouldn't have been that difficult. I mean, I, I figured it out before you did. But, uh, it, but it was, it was, it's a rare enough occurrence that, that it makes house MD. You know, it's like super rare cases. So. And this, when you have blood-filled cysts on your liver, if those things rupture, that's bad, right? In other areas in the body, you sort of compress the bleed and, and, and you manage it, whatever. In the liver, in the gut, you just sort of bleed and bleed, and that's, that's bad, right? So peliosis, hepatitis, bad. Oral steroids, possibility. But remember, five minutes, thanks. Tylenol, worse, right? Worse than steroids on your liver by a fair amount. Um, and so, so anybody who's legislating like, well, because oral steroids are harmful on the liver, we need to ban this. You cannot allow Tylenol to be legal. Tylenol, if, if that's why steroids are illegal, if that's the reason steroids are illegal, Tylenol needs to be a Schedule Three controlled substance for which possession puts you in prison. Now, if anybody says like, okay, okay, I get it, the, you know, the athlete's health thing, maybe, maybe we're, maybe we don't, A, don't care about the athlete, um, and B, you know, maybe, maybe there's, there's other reasons, but 
also the heart. You know, people will talk about the heart being Tylenol should be banned. Tylenol is really rough, but but it's different from I would say ibuprofen is conditionally worse. It depends on the conditions. It depends on what your goals are. A lot of these things are horrible for you. Um, left ventricular hypertrophy, the left ventricle, the pumping chamber to systemic circulation. Now, not the genetic version where you get this thick wall and and it's really problematic, but but thickening of the left ventricle. Um, well, maybe it happens a little bit, sure, but weightlifting is going to do. You go to the gym and let's say steroids. Let's say you have eleven months of training to put on, you know, whatever, 15 pounds or something, or you do it in steroids in like 11 weeks. You know, I can do it that fast, but, but let's, let's just say you ramp up things and the heart looks the same at the end of either phase. It just, you're accelerating a lot of, a lot of, um, growth, a lot of, a lot of tissue growth, but let's get back to Paul Thompson. Here's another Paul Thompson one. And he's not like biased against this he's just i mean this is like a legit brilliant physician he's like all right let's let's investigate this stuff for real um one of the leading researchers globally of statins cholesterol lowering drugs but he just happened to be studying this um at the time and looking it's like the, the title suffices you don't actually need to read the article left ventricular function is not impaired in weightlifters who use anabolic steroids that's really all you need to see. I mean, it's just this collection of, of you know, a bunch of MDs on there saying like, yeah, we're, we're not seeing anything. And, you know, another study that is uh, very similar. Um, the total amount of anabolic steroids reportedly used by the athletes is very large, amounting to 10 to 20 times that which would be normally recommended by a pharmaceutical manufacturer. And they didn't find any like, you know, less ventricular um, size or function. No, no differences. Same study 18 years later, basically the same study. In the current study, there was not any statistically significant difference in left ventricular systolic and diastolic dimensions between cases and control groups. Systolic and diastolic function in all groups is relatively similar and is suggestive of no effect or minimal effect of chronic anabolic steroid abuse, abuse, right? Not just use on size, function, and stiffness of the heart. Um, similar, there's a ton of these studies that are going to say similar things. This is the only one where you actually sort of start to see um, some effects uh, on the heart of, of, of what people are looking at, what people are accusing it of, of nine consistent, relatively monstrous years, um, uh, enormous doses, and the heart doesn't, you know, systole the squeeze. It's, it's not quite. It's not. It's not quite as good. Um, nine like unbroken years of like literally that uh, androgenic anabolic steroid users were remarkable for both their steroid uh, dose and duration of use. And it's like nine years to get there, and so. I know we're pretty much out of time. So let me just finish up this one, a couple of slides. And, but statistically and scientifically and biologically, physiologically, pharmacologically, however logically you want to do this, the sports are really what are hurting the athletes. You know, steroids isn't giving people, isn't requiring Tommy John's, or isn't, you know, destroying people's ulnar collateral ligament. It's not giving anyone concussions in football. It's not, the steroids aren't doing the harms that we see in sports. Sports are doing the harms. Football is killing people, not steroids. Like, and so if you're going to ban steroids for harming people, you have to make sports as illegal because sports are harming people way more, way more. They're not even in the same league. They're not even comparable. I mean, this, again, this isn't like apples, oranges, whatever. It's like, well, one's a little bit more than the other. I mean, it's like a ludicrous comparison of how much more harmful the sport is um, to the athlete. Um, yeah, 2005. Okay, 2005, the Controlled Substance Act um, started to include androstendione. Before then, when I was in high school, you could just go down to the supermarket and buy this stuff. And I had a friend who did, and I don't know, worked for him, whatever. He was, he was, he was in good shape. Um, but in 2005, it, it became a Schedule Three controlled substance, androstendione. Now, what is the first study ever to report about and androstendione and its effects on health? It's effects on side effects. Okay, this was January 2005. They made it a Schedule Three controlled substance. You could go to prison for having this stuff. January 2005. February 2005, the first ever article about its health um, and safety comes out. What did they find? We didn't find any side effects. A month after you can go to prison for owning this, the first ever study to talk about its I mean, and they were doing it on like pregnant rats. So it's not even like in people, but like, yeah, we, we didn't find any side effects. And at this point you can go to prison for having this thing. So nobody thinks that the reason steroids are illegal is because of the health detriment 
to the athlete taking it, right? Anyone who says that eh, doesn't really know the literature, right? Now, I should not be somebody to comment on the ethics of like, let's like fracking. I don't know shit about fracking, right? It's a word that sounds like bad for the environment. And I've, I've heard a lot of people shaky voices give these very emotional responses about we need to ban fracking, but I don't, I don't know shit about it. And, and so I shouldn't be the person who gives ethical discussions, political, like we need to ban fracking. That, that opinion should not come from this mouth. And yet the people who, who talk about banning steroids and the illegality and the harm and stuff, they don't know a shit about it. They don't know any more about steroids than I know about fracking, but at least I have enough integrity and self-respect not to run my mouth about subjects I don't know anything about. And so it's really important that we, that we come to an understanding of phenomena before we become boisterous and, and passionate and, and nearly violent ab about our, our descriptions and characterizations and, and condemning of, of people who, who use these things. And so, so far, athletes' health and whether steroids are effective, we've covered those two, but we have all the other ones still to go. So we'll, we'll pick up this stuff on Friday, we'll make a lot more progress. And then we'll start moving into enzymes and stuff. All right, what questions do we have? Were those studies that you were referencing um, talking about like cycling on and off? Because you can't really like, you have to cycle, right? That's, I'm not gonna name names, but like I know a lot of people that have done it and they talk about it and they say about the cycling and how like if you don't do that it can like your heart like won't be able to function some of the studies it's people who are cycling some of the studies are just consistent use and again like that one say nine years of consistent use before they actually saw anything um now i'm not saying the, the, the side effects didn't show up at seven years or something like that but but it takes it takes huge doses for an awfully long time before you see functional changes in the heart um that's not really what people are doing does ronnie coleman have functional changes in his heart maybe yeah maybe um you know jay cutler and do they have functional changes in the heart from stars maybe but like does the you know a collegiate baseball player have have changes in his heart nah there's no way you know, it's like, well, he's done like nine cycles. Like, who cares? Like, I, no, I'm not saying who cares, but what I'm saying is for the left ventricular function of the heart, that's, that's like, that was like rumors. Um, and that was stuff to say, like, let's get kids off drugs and what, what you're doing is unethical and you're a horrible person for doing steroids and whatever. Your heart, okay, the logic doesn't follow because there's no science to support that, that, that claim at the end, right? So am I a horrible person for doing X behavior? give me a, a valid reason. Don't, don't give me made up gibberish that somebody once said in the 80 that a coach said because he was mad at the opponent or whatever. You know, we, we have to, we have to ground these things in physiology and biology and, 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 you know, testable science. Um, and so can the heart change with steroids? Sure. Yes. The heart can change with steroids. Is it going to change when people do a few cycles of steroids in their college career or, or they're in the NBA and, and, you know, for four or five years, they're, they're, they're cycling? Nah, they're not going to see changes in the heart that way. Yeah, the, the ethical argument doesn't really apply either because if you're talking about um, steroids being unethical, then you have to consider if having a 162 game MLB season with like six days of rest the whole year or whatever like yeah that's, that's about ripping that up elbows or, yeah or if that's just them being greedy trying to make money off of uh, young men's talents or whatever so my my hunch which is an opinionated one but my hunch is that yeah you're right it's it's 162 or whatever games it is and yeah, how many shoulders can el and elbows can withstand this? Who cares? We just made an extra million dollars this year because we, you know, have you know, a couple extra games or whatever. Um, that's, I think, the motivation for a lot of these things. The yeah. funny part is um, steroids, you're actually going to preserve 
<laughs> the tissues. So you're going to, now this is a conditional thing. I, I'm not, I'm not saying you're like, oh, your liver is healthier and your heart is healthier and, and all, but, um, the recovery of, of tissues, you're, you're likely to see fewer overuse injuries and in elbows and shoulders and, and fill in the blank, whatever, you know, anatomical structures, if there's enough uh, androgen. That's why a lot of pitchers take it just because like being a starting pitcher or someone in the bullpen in the major leagues for, a, for nine months out of the year and then getting like a three months off season to try and recover, like there's pretty Work. much no way to do it for talk about the guys that have like 20 year careers like i'm pretty convinced that by the end of their careers they were on something there's there i think that that's pretty much that way for every sport now people will talk about you know tennis or you know cycling something like that and like well steroids isn't really those guys aren't all huge that's not what steroids are doing they're not making people huge and stuff they're they're enhancing recuperative power they're making you recover faster and so so if you're a tennis player of course you're on steroids i don't care who you are yeah how do you get back on the tennis court the next day you're all banged up from the day before of just direction changes of like all of that um those direction changes and and every little huh, you know in tennis they make that little grunt noise um every time they go like, huh, whatever there is there's something in the in the body below the grunt that is that is enduring damage stress and damage and and those loads are being tolerated and, and in order to repair a broken body and get it back on the tennis court the next day everyone's on steroids uh, more into like the negative side effects like that you know get transferred as rumors or like what people believe is there like a hormonal change permanently after you take dosages of steroids or does it take like a long time like with the heart example you gave there can be yeah so so um, for the hormonal changes, when you become sort of hypogonadal, so somebody goes off of steroids, it's actually really, this is a great question. When somebody goes off of steroids, there is often this dip before a recovery. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know what doses and durations are going to associate with more of a chronic deficit, but what, what, what you'll see is uh, it actually takes a little bit of time to get going, but you, you'll see this enhanced improvement where people are on steroids and their their lifts are increasing and their you know body composition and, and dimensions and 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 those anthropometric variables you know what your your measurements so, um, all of that stuff is starts improving at a faster rate. Now people go off steroids and they might dip a little bit they're not going to dip back down to baseline right but they dip a little bit emotionally they feel like shit because they, don't, they were feeling wonderful and it's sort of like ah oh, I, I had no pain and i my uh, you know like when you have that triumphant buzz you, like you have alcohol for the first time in six months or something and and like walk across the street and like oh the cars will stop for me you know that sort of that sort of uh, um spectacular self um satisfying ego sensation um what i hear about people who are on steroids is they just feel awesome and they go off of steroids and their results decline they have this temporary sort of hypogonadal experience and their results decline and their mood tanks and that's where you start to see addiction of of where the psychological addiction of, of people go right back into it of like oh yeah, screw this i'm not i'm not i'm not gonna like wallow and 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 wither you know i i want to i want to get back to what i was doing before and so they'll go back on it and become sort of reliant to a degree on on steroids for their emotional well-being and and their their identities and, and so i think you get into that domain where people have this long chronic uh effective use unbroken and stuff and and you can see some some chronic uh deficits but but it, i don't know where that that chronic corner is where you turn that corner i i, I don't know where that would be um because you do see recovery you just see a dip, a temporary dip, an acute dip, and then recovery. But somewhere, it is sure to have a chronic deficit. And I'm not sure where that is. I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of doses or durations that associates with. Okay, so um, at least what I'm getting, uh, correct me if I like misunderstood, 
So there's no true like permanent damage. It's just, you have to go through that duration to get back to where your hormones were originally, like baseline. As soon as those androgens leave, as soon as the injection stops cycling, right? As, as soon as like, well, this week, no needle went in and another week with no needle and another week with no needle. At that point, you will dip in your in your um, androgen supply, right? The testes just you're like, oh, well, this is coming in from an artificial source. I can I can take a nap, and that's we're all sort of lazy when somebody starts doing. I mean, there's tons of research on this of of learned helplessness. Um, learned helplessness. There was these really cruel experiments with dogs a long time ago, but, but every creature succumbs to learned helplessness. If if somebody comes and just like does all your chores for you you stop doing chores forever if somebody comes and you know does your homework for you you sort of stop doing homework if so, and learned helplessness the testicles they're, they're no different from you and me right they're, they have learned helplessness too oh, well, you, someone else is doing all this work for me i don't gonna do anything i'm just gonna take a nap and, and watch you know youtube all day so so th that's sort of how anatomy behaves but once you let's stick with the analogy once somebody like stops vacuuming and like the house gets messy like oh fuck now i gotta clean again and then you get off the sofa and turn off hulu and start vacuuming yourself and so that's sort of how the testicles behave where yeah we have that hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and and the gonads get a little bit loungy and lazy but they, they come back. They know how to do chores still. Um, now, at some point, at some point, they they must atrophy to a degree where they like suck at vacuuming the house afterward. But again, I don't know when that is. You don't really, I, I have not seen literature that says, you know, go do a few cycles and, and the testes forget how to vacuum. I have not seen a study that, that says that. Um, but at some point, I'm sure there is a permanent effect. Like all things, there's permanence uh, in excess, but um, but yeah, to to answer your question in a, in a less circuitous um, kind of example laden way, uh, it, it's it is unlikely that there's going to be permanent endocrine damage in like a normal person's normal couple of cycles. One of my college coaches had us do five a.m. weights during season. And then he'd yell at us why we were second to last place. And I was like, well, I could tell you exactly why, like and what you should do to what I've found to be disappointing in coaching is often these are very high paid positions. Um, there's a lot of, you know, these coaches, six figure salaries, and they don't know anything. Now they're, they may know some strategy they, 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 they may be um, effective strategists of, of, you know, when to lay down that bunt or whatever. Fine. But when it gets into into like the training elements and how to condition yourself and and how to structure a a training and conditioning and practice schedule and all that, they really don't know anything, and that's it sort of removes any talent they have with the strategy because now they have non athletes and how do you, how do you make non athletes win? You know, it's like okay, yeah, my my ruined athletes are following a really good strategy. I had just came, it was my first year uh, coming back after a labrum surgery. And I had had a really successful uh, summer season and was like throwing really hard and everything. And then he was complaining about uh, why my arm was doing worse during the fall. And he kept blaming me. He was like, oh, well, you must not be doing like your exercises or whatever. And I was like, no, I'm literally doing everything like Athletes are usually willing to work hard. If someone's not willing to work hard, then like, I don't know what to do with them in any capacity. You know, if it's academia or it's athletics or it is any workforce, whatever, if people can't work hard, there's really nothing that can be done to win with those people. But if people will work hard, which traditionally, typically, generally, athletes are willing to work hard. At that point, if you have people who are willing to work hard, you should be able to win. Half the coaches in college sports, I feel like they're not like educated in any of the stuff. Like coaches, most of them don't know it, and their careers would be their their effectiveness 
would be enhanced so greatly if they just learned physiology. But they think they're right already. And they may have been wonderful players. They may have been very effective players. And again, they may be great at strategy. But I, if you give me, like, let's say I'm going to try to take a bunch of students to, um, I don't know, some sort of, let's say there's like a scientific jeopardy or something. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to take like 10 students to go compete in this academic thing. Uh, if the students I get all have IQs of like 48, I, I don't know what to do with them. I don't know how to compete. You know, I could be the best strategist in the world, but I, 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 don't, I don't know how to, how to get them to compete. And I feel like that's what the, what, what the, once upon an athlete coaches often do is there are these great strategists, but they destroy bodies so much that the physical equivalent of an IQ, some sort of like a PQ, a performance Q, whatever, some sort of, some sort of physiological, biological performance equivalent of, of an IQ is so destroyed that they just can't compete anymore. It's not rocket science. You know, you just have to listen to people that know what they're doing, <laughs> especially in college. It's like, these kids are only 18, like 21 years old. Their hormones are going to do the job if you just don't screw them up and let them train and develop. Like, I don't know. You basically just have to let them develop and not injure them. And they're going to be, if they want to put the work in, like they'll, a lot of them have what it takes. It's just like they get injured and don't ruin their own athletic ability. Like a lot of coaches just make you unathletic by their like, their way of training it's yeah i agree all right let's get out of here all right um i will see everyone on friday